Well, complex sinusoids are an important part of signal processing. And we can define a complex sinusoid, x of t, with amplitude a and frequency omega naught and phase phi, just as I've written here. We've got a e to the j omega naught t plus phi. Now we recall that the Euler identity, which says that r e to the j theta can be expressed as r cosine theta plus j times r sine theta. And applying this to our newly defined complex sinusoid, we see that the complex sinusoid actually consists of a cosine and a sine term. So I can write this as a cosine of omega naught t plus phi plus j times a sine of omega naught t plus phi. So the real part of this complex sinusoid has a cosine shape and the imaginary part has sinusoidal behavior. But we can sketch this in the complex plane, draw our axes here. This will be our real axis, and this will be our imaginary axis. And this point, waveform x of t, has length a, and then the phase is omega naught t plus phi. So this is actually a vector that is changing with its location with time. So let's draw it and we'll call this x of t it is going to have length a so make that the length there and um, the angle of this vector changes with time, so this is move, rotating at a rate given by omega naught, and then um, the starting position, starting angle is phi. So let's suppose um, this will be x of zero, and that has angle phi. Okay, so that's how we can think of this in a complex plane. If I graph the um, projections of this point on the real and the imaginary axis, what you see is that the projection on the real axis, this point here, is going to be a cosine of omega naught t plus phi. And the projection on the imaginary axis, which is this point here, is going to be a sine of omega naught t plus phi. Suppose I draw the projection on the imaginary axis over here. So let's like this, the imaginary axis. And we'll have this as a function of time. So t. So what's happening here is if I look at how this rotating, this rotating vector, how this, um, the projection that it traces out on the imaginary axis, it's going to do something like, let's see, this is time zero, so uh, we've got this sinusoidal shape, we're going to something like that, okay, with time. And it gets about, let's see, this point here is one revolution and so how long is that going to take? That's going to take uh, 2 pi over omega naught um, seconds, okay? Because this is rotating at at omega naught radians per second. And we're going counterclockwise here.
Okay, so the projection on the imaginary axis looks like this. Well, the projection on the real axis is uh, going to be take the form of the cosine. So if I let this be my real axis and this be time going down the page, I'm going to have uh, something that looks like a cosine. And the, um, let's see, the starting point, the, P, the maximum should not be at zero because uh, we've got some phi offset here. So um, this is uh, t equals zero, and this is amplitude a, and this is amplitude minus a. Forgot to put those on the uh, imaginary axis. We'll put those there now. This is a and minus a. Anyway, so back to this uh, real axis, and again, it, it gets to um, one revolution at when t is equal to 2 pi over omega naught, and then the, the signal repeats again. Okay, so this is a complex sinusoid, has two components, a real part and an imaginary part, that both have uh, sinusoidal behavior. So you can ask why would we use such, why would such signals be important and it turns out that they simplify our notation and um, our analysis or computation. Okay, so they they simplify things for us, even, uh, even though it looks like it's more complicated. And why is that? Well, uh, basically because of the way the phase works in the complex exponential. Let's write, um, let's look at it. So let's write a e to the j omega naught t plus phi. Now using the property of exponents that the sum of exponents corresponds to multiplication of exponentials, I can factor out the phase term like this. I can write this as a e to the j phi times e to the j omega naught t. And we'll just lump a e to the j phi into some complex number c times e to the j omega naught t. And what we see here is that I have my amplitude and phase effects in this multiplica multiplicative constant. And um, so this is a linear relationship. I can pull this constant out, if I wish, of, away from the uh, exponent. In contrast, if I look at a real sinusoid and I have a cosine of omega naught t plus phi, in this case, well, the amplitude is multiplying out front but the phase is embedded in the transcendental function here. So it's really hard to access the phase um, directly. It's not like just a multiplying factor up front, which we've managed to do up here in the uh, complex sinusoid. Now there's a couple important identities that we need to talk about with complex sinusoids and it's not too hard to see using either the Euler expansion or our representation in the complex plane that um, we have 
the cosine of some number z can be expressed as e to the jz plus e to the minus jz divided by 2. Similarly, I can express the sine of some number z as e to the jz minus e to the minus jz divided by 2j. And using this, we see that the real sinusoid, a cosine of, let's do this one in discrete time, omega naught n plus phi, can be expressed as a sum of two complex sinusoids. This is going to be a over 2, e to the j omega naught n plus phi, plus a over 2, e to the minus j omega naught n plus phi. And similarly, I can write a sine in the same, in an analogous manner, a sine of omega naught n plus phi is just a over 2j e to the j omega naught n plus phi minus a over 2j times e to the minus j omega naught n plus phi. A real sinusoid maps into a sum of two complex sinusoids. Now one of those complex sinusoids has a positive frequency and then the other has a negative frequency. This raises the question, well what does negative frequency mean? Let's look at the positive frequency case again. If I have in the complex plane, I've got my real axis and my imaginary axis. If I look at a signal that has a positive frequency, that's say e to the j omega naught t, that's rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. Well, what a negative frequency does is it rotates in the opposite direction. And we'll draw our axes here, got a real axis, imaginary axis. And if I have e to the minus j omega naught t, that's a vector that's rotating in a clockwise direction. And write the rate here. So this is clockwise. So negative frequency has meaning when we talk about complex exponentials and what that refers to is the direction of rotation, this vector in the, in the complex plane, or equivalently the relationship between the cosine part and the sine part of the complex sinusoid. So let's suppose that we have a cosine. Well, we said that was going to be e to the j omega naught t plus e to the minus j omega naught t. So here we're going to have, let's call this e to the j omega naught t, and this is rotating in this direction. And then I'm going to add uh, a phasor or a rotating vector that's rotating in the opposite direction. So this is e to the minus j omega naught t, and that rotates in this direction. And at time zero, both of these are on the real axis. And you can see that if I add these two vectors up, that the resultant always lies on the real axis, because the imaginary parts are the negative of one another. These are, you know, this term is rotating in the clock, counterclockwise direction at the same rate as this one is rotating in the clockwise direction.
And when you add them up, you get a projection on the real axis that varies as a function of time. And when both these vectors are aligned on the imaginary axis, they sum to zero, and that's the uh, zero crossing of the cosine. When they're both, uh, both these vectors line up on this axis, that's the negative maximum of the cosine and so on. And similarly, with a sine, I can write a sine in terms of my uh, complex plane here by saying that it consists of a, again, one sinusoid that's um, rotating in the positive omega naught direction. And then the other one has a minus sign, which uh, means it has a 180 degree uh, flip at t equals zero. So let's draw it over here. And this one rotates in the opposite direction, negative frequency term. And if I add these two vectors up, I always get something that's on the imaginary axis, and that gives me the the, the sine component.